first talk of the lectures today is by Mark Polycott, estimating dimension and diagnostic points. Thank you. Um, let me begin by thanking the organizers for the opportunity to be here and to present these two lectures. Um, what else should I say? Um, okay, so one comment I've written on the board already is that my notes, which are these, uh, I have scanned and you can find a copy on my webpage. Uh, they run to 22 pages of rather erratically written uh, notes <coughs> with my handwriting. Um, but they give you some idea of what I'm writing on the board, hopefully. So now you can leave and read them somewhere else, in some cafe somewhere, perhaps, or something like that. And uh, the other uh, preliminary thing was that uh, in my usual uh, fruitless attempt to curry favour with the audience, I brought some chocolate. Um, it didn't always work so well as I did in the morning, but you can save it for the chocolate. Although I didn't entirely to figure out how to and circulate them if she feels so inclined. Um, okay, so what I want to do is to talk about estimating numbers. And the numbers are typically going to be the Hausdorff dimension of very simple systems. Uh, and sometimes the Lyapunov exponents, um, which is going to be a sort of phase change sort of halfway through the course. And uh, so the kind of philosophy is that I should remember the chalk here breaks easily. Uh, so the uh, philosophy is that uh, there are certain invariants, certain values, of which I'm thinking of Hausdorff dimension and Lyapunov exponents, um, which it's useful to know. values. And unfortunately, typically, these values are not in some sort of simple expression. So uh, typically, not a simple so-called closed form. So if you have the middle third cancel set, you good luck. It, its uh, dimension is log 2 over log 3. Or the uh, Sierpinski gasket, maybe it's log th um, 3 over log 2, something like that. They're very explicit formulas, but generally, if you have any other sort of uh, system, it's kind of hard to, to nail down exactly the value. And so, the, the idea is what we want to do is um, we want to numerically compute things. We want to find a, a numerical value when we can. Uh, and we want to have one which has um, uh, the properties that it's rigorous, rigorous, and also efficient. So if you ask your laptop to give you the dimension of some particular set, it would be convenient if you actually believe the answer, so you'd like it to be rigorous, and you'd also like it to be efficient. You don't want to wait a week for the answer to come back, unless you're particularly ambitious in that direction. Um, so let me just mention some classical examples. Classical examples of what? Well, of sets that people try to compute the Hausdorff dimension. And so the first one is the ever popular uh, Julia sets. A subject in which I know almost nothing, but let me pretend I do. So let's imagine that you have the Julia set uh, J of T. It's going to be inside the extended complex plane. And it's associated to a rational map. And the map is going to be uh, uh, just the rational map called T, what we call something. And um, the Julia set, of course, is defined in some appropriate way. Let's say, for example, it's a set of points in the complex plane uh, with the property that um, uh, you take a, a periodic point and you ask that, you have to put the same letter, 
and you ask that the uh, derivative should be uh, given one. Let me take the closure. You can see my lack of facility of rational maps. I don't write these things very easily. And so in the case that uh, you take uh, t of z to be uh, z squared plus c, then if you take c equal to a zero, then you're in better shape, because in this case the Julia set is just a circle, and uh, the dimension of the circle is just equal to one. That's meant to be a circle rather than a, a zero. Uh, but if you choose um, if you choose c to be uh, small but non-zero, uh, say small, then the uh, Hausdorff dimension of the Julia set will be a bit more mysterious. It will be bigger than than uh, one, but then it will be some unknown value depending on c, of course, some sort of quasi circle. So that's one sort of set where one might want to do this, or for example, if you use a specific value of c, like uh, minus one, uh, then you get some well-known named Julia set, like the basilica or something like that. So in these cases, it's not known. There's no close simple expression for the dimension. You have to worry about uh, computing it. Uh, so let me talk about another classical set of examples. And uh, this is going to be um, uh, limit sets for fixing groups. Uh, not all fixing groups. I'll just draw a particular example. And so these are going to be limit sets. So it's going to be a Cantor set associated with a certain example. So fixing limit sets. And so uh, let me think of a particular example. So uh, you take uh, the unit circle. So this is bounded to the disk, D2. Here's the, the origin. And then one way to construct an example of a uh, Schottky group, which is an example of a Fuchsian group, is to draw uh, three uh, circular arcs which I will draw very badly, pretty badly. They're all meant to be symmetric, so you can see the inferior quality of my drawing already. Uh, they all meet the boundary uh, perpendicularly, but they are circular arcs, like that. And then you associate uh, three uh, maps, T1, T2, and T3. And these are going to be maps from uh, the disk to itself, and they will be Mobius maps. And if I denote these curves uh, C1, uh, C2, and C3, um, I can make my usual joke about writing C1, and you can say if you've seen one, you've seen all of it. So this is just C1, C2, and C3. They're just curves. So C1, and C2, and C3 are circular arcs. Circular arcs. So Q, so Q, arcs. And then the idea is that we want to define uh, some sort of uh, transformations. And these Mobius maps, I'm going to ask that uh, Ti fixes uh, Ci. But it also reflects inside the, uh, the curve. So in particular, the effect of T1 will be that it maps this half to this half, half being in and out of this uh, curve here, so it would be T1. Another map would be uh, T3, and this would that would be uh, T2. Uh, so I should say it fixes all the points on this line to make it well defined. But basically, we now have three transformations that move stuff around, and then the idea is that um, we can define a group of motions corresponding to this, and we look at the orbit. of uh, zero under the group generated by these things, so under action of T1, T2, and T3. And the effect is that it moves around, so the image under uh, T2 would be up here, 
that would be T2 of 0, the image under T3 would be somewhere down here, and the image under T1 will be somewhere down here, so it's T1 of 0, and you just keep going, you just keep applying the transformations to now these four points, or three points, extra points, and what happens is that you get infinitely many points, and in the Euclidean sense they accumulate in a Cantor set in the boundary. So, accumulates Well, to a set, which is the name I've given uh, x uh, theta, I'll explain what theta is in a minute, um, in uh, the unit circle, it's the boundary of this. What is theta? Well, theta is a parameter I'm going to introduce. So, imagine I've drawn this somewhat more symmetrically, then theta would be uh, the angle subtended at the origin by each of these three curves, which I'm assuming are also symmetrically placed. Uh, not poorly drawn, but there you go, like that. This is an example which is due to uh, McMullen. But given theta, I've now associated a, a Cantor set that sits in the boundary. And you could ask what the, the household dimension of that is. Uh, so, for example, um, if we take uh, theta to be uh, some particular angle, so maybe it's going to be 93.2857 degrees, using degrees rather than radians, um, then uh, this would be enough to imply that the dimension the, um, the set x theta, this cancel set, is going to be equal to a half. <clears throat> if you wanted to find a value for which it was equal to a half. And in particular, if the angle is, um, let me call this guy theta zero, and so moreover, if uh, theta is uh, bigger than theta zero, then what happens, of course, is that um, the cancel set gets fatter, it gets bigger, then it would imply that the uh, dimension of the, uh, the set x theta would be bigger than a half. And it's kind of relevant in some applications because uh, in some number theoretic results of uh, Borgan and Sarnak, um, there are two cases corresponding to whether or not your limit set has got household dimension bigger than a half or smaller than a half. Because you can use different <coughs> techniques. Um, but since we're not doing that, I won't uh, labor that point. And so that was a second example. So the first example was Julia sets. Uh, the second example was just Cantor sets, uh, which are limit sets of some motions or, or some group acting in disk. And the third example um, is even easier. Um, it's just going to be uh, restricted uh, digits in the uh, continue fractions expansion. So let me just call it restricted. Digits tonight in continued fractions. So the game here is that you choose uh, a subset of the natural numbers. My natural numbers don't include zero, so it starts at one, and I'll also assume that this is a finite subset then uh, what I want to do is associate some set, and the set I'll call E subscript A. It's going to be a subset of the unit interval. It's going to consist of those points in the unit interval whose continued fraction expansion looks a bit like this. Um, which, of course, I, I, I will henceforth just denote as A1, A2, A3, Etc. So it's just a continued fraction expansion. So if I allowed all natural numbers, then any irrational number between um, 0 and 1 could be written in this way. But I'm actually going to require that this lies in my set A for i greater than or equal to whatever I start with 1. And so if I restrict in this way, then what I get is a, a Cantor set it still lies inside the unit interval. But it's going to be a cancel set.
And some people are interested in the, uh, the dimension of this uh, set uh, because it plays a role in some number theoretic uh, applications. So it has a number theoretic theoretic applications. Uh, particularly through the work of people like Maria uh, and Mateus and these guys. Uh, so let me make it slightly more less, less, less confusing by saying just Diophantine approximation. Diophantine approximation and the Brown spectrum. Which may make it less confusing or more confusing, but we can just ignore it anyway. Um, so what I want to do is talk about how in these three kind of examples, or, or more generally, uh, one would try to say something about the numerical value of the Hausdorff dimension. And uh, rather than uh, labor at some great level of generality, uh, I'm going to concentrate more or less on one setting, on the understanding that all the ideas generalize in a rather obvious way to, to the general case. Cases. So I'll use a sort of common theme, and it's something that we, we saw already, <clears throat> particularly in Carroll's lectures, and uh, it's to use iterated function schemes. <coughs> or sometimes systems, depending on what you think the S should stand for. Um, and I'm going to consider henceforth uh, I'm going to consider a very simple setting. Consider maybe the simplest setting. Simplest. So what is the simplest setting? The simplest setting might be we just take the unit interval and we look at a bunch of contractions. I mean it, it doesn't cover the cases I've written down, except for the third one. Um, but it uh, can easily be adapted to that, that purposes. So let me just remind you of um, the notation, or at least my notation. So if you haven't seen my notation, I won't be reminding you, but let me remind you of some notation. And I will use a fairly obvious approach. <clears throat> So the setting is going to be iterative function schemes. So what I want to do is to have a bunch of contractions so that uh, T1 up to uh, Tk Well, it helps if they have some differentiability. Uh, I'm going to assume that they um, are C2. Uh, Carl Roy was assuming they were C1 plus the theta, which of course C2 implies that, so we're in reasonable shape. Um, and I want to assume that they are contracting which in particular means that I wrote the chalk again uh, in particular means that um, if I look at the uh, derivative of these maps then uh, the subnorm which is not unlike the subnorm so x up to 1 of derivative so this quantity is going to be smaller than one uh, for each of the maps. I try to use a convention that k is the number of contractions. So usually when I write down stuff like subshifts of finite type, I try to use k symbols. Otherwise, I start using n, and then I'm not quite sure how to label my symbols. So if I stick to this sort of convention, it may or may not work. You will discover. Um, I also want to assume uh, some sort of disjointness. By which I simply mean that um, typically Ti of uh, 0, 1, the image of one interval, uh, will be disjoint from the other. So for i not equal to j, or sometimes one might say uh, strong separation condition. So 
I have contractions on the unit interval, and they're going to map uh, me down to somewhere else. So I tend to draw pictures a bit like this as well. Here's the unit interval, and I just got a bunch of contractions which may be in different colours. We will see. Uh, so this is going to be one of the contractions. It's obviously down here. Here you are. That's going to be uh, T1. There's going to be a bunch of them. Since I can't be bothered to draw too many, I think there's going to be two at the moment. Uh, so this will be down here, so this will be image down here, blah blah blah, and that will be T2. Yeah. So that's the picture I sort of have in mind, maybe with K contractions rather than 1. So um, right. the intersection should be empty? Uh, I want the intersection to be empty, thank you. I knew there was something missing in the statement. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The intersection presumably always exists, but on this occasion we want it to be empty, yeah. And that's the disjointness. Thank you. Uh, so in higher dimensions, um, which I'm not going to deal with particularly, uh, we, we, we need something else. So in higher dimensions, what does higher dimensions mean? Well, it means higher real dimensions, so more than an interval. Um, we need uh, conformality. Why is that? Well, because unfortunately uh, in, in dimensional theory or in analysis people like to deal with balls, whereas in dynamics one likes to deal with maps, and unfortunately mapping balls around doesn't necessarily keep them as balls, unless you assume that they're, they're conformal. And for the unit uh, interval, of course, everything is conformal because there's only one dimension. And let me just stay for completeness, or maybe even for notation, so here's the definition. Given my contractions, my iterated uh, function scheme, um, I can associate a nice set, and I'll denote that as the set X, so the limit set. Or protractor. In other lectures, it is uh, the unique, unique, uh, closed, not empty. context will be in the unit interval because that's the only place we live, um, such that something is true, such that if I apply uh, the transformation to each of the, so each of the transformations to my set, and I take the union, i equals 1 up to, to k, then I get the thing I first thought of, which is just the same set. Okay, so this is just the definition that occurred before. It's the natural way to associate with this um, a set. And that's the set that we're interested in. And so this theorem is a theorem by Hutchinson. Um, and it says such a set exists and is unique. And it's a simple proof as well. What more could you ask? Excellent. So now we have a, 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 a sort of, sort of dynamical-ish set up, we have a bunch of contractions, and that's somewhere down here we have our, our set, uh, which is x, which is going to be the attractor, and that's the thing for which we're trying to compute the dimension. Hello? Sorry, um, if you're assuming the strong separation condition and you're applying it to continued fractions, then you're not allowing A to have consecutive digits. Right? Yes, I'm doing it in a very uh, random way. So if I, if I was doing it for the setting, I might have to iterate the map a few times to get the disjointness. Yeah. You'll notice I do these kind of sloppy things. It's, I, I claim it's in the interests of, of clarity and simplicity, whereas it's just me not paying attention to things. Marius, how are you? Yes, uh, so far we do not need it, but uh, will not you assume that uh, derivatives are never equal to zero of these maps? Let's, let's, let's assume that as well, if you like. That's a good idea. Yeah, I, I probably don't need it, as you say, but I, I think I'm going to assume it because you're, you're a sage man, and I, I'm worried that something will go wrong a bit later if you don't. So let's assume this is true as well. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, so, so we've got our attractor, and then um, we can associate to this um, the, the uh, dimension. So I keep mentioning Hausdorff dimension, but in the present context, um, the Hausdorff dimension will be the same as the, um, the box dimension or the Minkowski dimension. And so in my notes, I've written down a uh, definition of the uh, box dimension, but I think perhaps I will not 
write it out, since we all know what it is. And so let me just say, in this setting, in this setting uh, household dimension is equal to the box dimension. Oops, box. And so I'll probably typically just denote it just by the dimension. Hoping it's not confused with any other form of dimension, which is not the household dimension or box dimension. Okay. And so we're back to the uh, usual problem, the one that I stated at the beginning. Uh, given this setup, a bunch of contractions, a, a compact uh, set at the end, how can we estimate its dimension, sort of numerically? So how can we estimate the dimension of x. And <coughs> I want in the, in the course of these, uh, these uh, hour, these, these precious minutes all spent together, uh, I want to um, describe three different approaches. Not, not in great detail, but at least say something about them. So we can discuss uh, three approaches. So um, the first one is uh, the following. So here I, I talked about these contractions and I talked about examples such as uh, the one with the deleted digits for the continued fraction. I didn't write down explicitly what the maps were there. I'll get back to that later. Um, but uh, in that case, um, the maps, the contractions are not linear. So the basic thing is you just like to approximate them by something that is linear. Hey, that sounds easy. So the first one is just to approximate, approximate the maps uh, Ti over there when they're not linear by uh, affine maps or maybe similarities, i.e. affine maps. Working on the principle that affine maps are easier to deal with, and indeed they are. Uh, a second method, which I'll get around to talking to a bit later, is some method involving sort of determinants. I'm just using this as an opportunity to say the words. What do I mean by the determinants? Well, it turns out that the determinant here is actually going to be some complex function, um, which I'll get around to defining a bit later. And uh, the third method, which I will spend hopefully a bit more time on, because it's easier and it gives you the best results, um, is something called, uh, well, I call it the minimax method. Minimax method. I don't think anyone else calls it that, so I have to be careful when I say what it means. So I've got three different methods which I'm going to use to uh, study um, this particular class of problems, trying to encourage you to think it's applicable to a more broad class of problems. Um, so let me try to, to give some comparison of these methods before I've actually told you what they are. But let me try to say something about um, one of the problems I've already mentioned and other people's and, and our progress on estimating these things. So, as I said before, the aim is to try to get a number in which you have 100% confidence, or at least a range of values in which you have 100% confidence that the value is inside there, and you want to do it in a time which is kind of reasonable. We, in this case, is probably me and my computer, um, but it might be some other people as well. So here is a, an example. What? Well, it's of the three methods, and it's applied to one of these sets, and it will be E2, which is the set whose continued fraction expansion involves only the digits ones and twos. Uh, so let me actually write that down. So that would be the set of points x, these continued fraction expansions. Since I've already rubbed it out, I should write it down again. So this will be a, whoops, uh, 
yeah, AI is an element of one or two, and this is for I greater than equal to one. Is this the same? Why not? Um, okay, what else do I want to say about it? Ah, oh, so in this case, uh, in this case, it is given by an iterator function scheme, so we can take uh, t1 of x to be equal to 1 over 1 plus x, and we can take 2 of x to be 1 over uh, 2 plus x, ignoring the fact that, that t1 of x doesn't actually contract to the value 0, but we can overcome that, it's not so difficult. Um, and in this case, um, the set e12 is the attractor. It's kind of obvious, so I mean, you know, the attractor should be that you apply the map, each of the maps to the set, take the union, you get the first thing, well, if you apply these maps to any point inside here, all it does is to shove in a new digit, one or two, into the continued fraction, so you've actually started. So it's kind of easy to check. And so what's, what's known about this is lots of stuff. So this, this example was considered by uh, Good in uh, 1941. Uh, uh, Good was a, a code breaker at uh, Bletchley Park in Britain, uh, who were breaking the codes a bit after the Polish guys, but that's, uh, that's life. Um, and he showed that um, when you estimate uh, the dimension of, or he estimated the dimension of one or two, um, then in fact uh, he, got a, he got an estimate to two decimal places. Now, presumably the computer that they were just building at Bletchley Park was not very sophisticated and unable to help with more places. And uh, after this, uh, there's a result by Mondi, if I spell correctly, and this is from 1985, who estimated the same thing, but he did it to six decimal places. And uh, as a result by Falk and Nussbaum, those of us who love transfer operators, it's the same Nussbaum who had these results on quasi-compactness. Um, and he had a result to, uh, I think, eight decimal places. You may be wondering why I keep writing decimal places and not putting a dash. I'm also wondering that, but I'm in the habit now, so I'm not going to continue. Um, and so the method used here was the first one. They, they look at these maps, they're not linear, but let's approximate them in some way by linear guys. And then we use that to get these estimates. And then subsequently, uh, there was a result by uh, Jenkinson with my first PhD student and uh, myself. And uh, we had an approach where we got an estimate to 100 decimal places. And this used the, the second mysterious method, which I will describe later. And then subsequently, uh, there is a result by uh, Myself and uh, Colleen of Nova. Uh, we have an estimate to 200 decimal places. And uh, this uses the third method, which I haven't described either. And uh, the improvement here is that it's a very simple dynamic system, just two contractions on an interval. But the Cantor set itself is, you know, despite its simplicity of writing it down, it's a bit hard to get access to, as you can see from the difficulty in understanding it through the first uh, few methods, uh, the first few uh, attempts. But nowadays, um, using uh, more appropriate methods, different methods, you can try to get much better results. So the simplicity of the system doesn't help you with the first approach, helps a bit with the second approach, but it's very good for the third approach, uh, which I will describe. And um, all of them down this end, they're all computer assisted. So it uses a computer. 
And um, the result of mine with, with Oliver Jenkinson uh, took a week for the computer to grind out this, this result, uh, whereas uh, the estimate with Polina takes about an hour on my desktop. Um, why, why do we stop at 100 well, or 200? Because we get fed up, basically. You can just keep going. It just takes longer and longer and longer. Um, my usual criteria for when to stop a calculation is uh, about 30 minutes, because it's the time it takes me to go and get coffee and come back again. <laughs> and if it's not finished by then, I'm fed up and I want to do something else. So is it um, Hello? proved that uh, you can uh, approximate it to arbitrary at some places? Yeah. Can you just keep running? You, you, in, theoretically, yes, if you had enough time. So um, I'll say a bit more a bit later. Uh, so, so the first method, it converges very slowly. Uh, this is what uh, Carl was mentioning. It goes like, um, uh, so somehow there's a parameter in the approximation, but it doesn't. It doesn't. It, it just goes far too slowly. And and in the case, so if you want to say double the number of decimal places, it will take you a long time. Uh, in the case of um, <coughs> method two, which is this complex analysis stuff, um, you can you, you you can get more and more decimal places. So if we tried to get from 100 to 200 using this method. Uh, we could do that, but it would take the lifetime of the universe because there's an exponential growth in the amount of information you have to apply. So we don't do that generally. Uh, it's just, it's just uh, it's, as we say in English, uh, forces for courses. Different methods work better for different problems, and so in particular, for this very simple example, this, this, this third method, which I haven't got around to describing, which I should make an effort to do fairly soon, um, is, is more uh, successful. Whenever you like. It's entirely up to you. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just a speaker. Right? The audience can do. It. They're in charge.